，呃，今天啊，讲楞严经之前说一下。Well, today, before our actual class, I would like to address something first. Maybe we will not have a very long class because I was engaged in meetings all day、uh, with、uh, the authorities from. The prefecture and、uh, from the county and so on. So I probably won't be able to elaborate too much on the class.、Uh, well,、um, also in terms of those of you who are receiving classes in the Shrine Hall, as I mentioned before, I don't want to address this again and again, but I think it's necessary due to. Special conditions that we are in right now, other than the those of you who are permitted to be here, I think those of you who are not permitted to be here should not come to the shrine hall. I think you should just. Stay at home and、uh, listen to the class. I will not elaborate too much on the reasons. Also, if I were to not address on it, then more and more people will show up every day, and maybe it will create obstacles, and I may not be able to continue to teach. So there are various things and conditions, situations that we need to temporarily. Uh, they make some changes to comply with the situation that we're in now. Other than those of you who are in the presentation group and need to be here, the rest of you should just stay home and receive the classes at home. Yesterday during the presentation. Uh, during the presentation uh, session uh, after uh, class, uh, it seems uh, that uh, the discipline and the uh, uh, the um, ambience uh, I felt uh, at the time was really not good. It was too noisy and chaotic. When it comes to management, I think what is most difficult and most energy-consuming is the things that's related to people. My energy devoted to translating and preparing for study, for for giving classes, and even including to meetings, that they are manageable. But when it comes to The people over here, the sangha over here, it is very difficult to manage so many people. Especially whenever I see some inappropriate actions, and whenever I see so many people on the road and not complying to、um, what I have said before. On one hand, I do understand. I do understand that there are disciples who are good disciples, and there are bad disciples. There are not so good disciples, and it has been the case for many great masters throughout history. Whenever I see so many people crowds up when I walk through, and then I really don't have any way out. Because if I were to、uh, touch on the crowd and give the blessings, then more and more people would crowd up, and it's really not convenient. Today I also had a conversation with the composer from Lojo, and we said that on one hand, when we have more people here, of course it's wonderful, but on the other, it is very difficult. To To engage in management, Kamosa from Lojo would uh, receive uh, audience uh, uh, of uh, the Tibetan fellow sangha members uh, every single day, and uh, lots of people there. And uh, for me, if I were to engage in those kinds of public audience, uh, then. It's endless. I have to sign their books, or I have to、uh, do this and that for them, and it's very time-consuming. So, to Laranga right now, what is the most difficult is about the management of people. This year, we had sent out some female practitioners away because they are not in a very good mental state. And on the other, I've heard that there was a male sangha member who、uh, burned his finger to make offering 
to the Buddha. So there are various kinds of situations that are not appropriate. Uh, because the true offering of, the, of the one's body is not to cut off your finger. A little while ago, we've sent someone to, uh, back to their home because um, uh, he or she was not in the right frame of uh, his or her mind. And I'm not so sure if that person's from Larungar either, but that person was dressed in the monastic robes. So when it comes to the management of people, uh, monastics and uh, lay practitioners, it's very difficult to follow all the way through. So, I have to spend lots of effort and energy in this regard. On top of that, my health is not like how I used to be. This year I've been having lots of headaches and various kinds of uh, situations. A little while ago, it was like that as well. So my health is not uh, permitting me to engage in various kinds of aspects of work. I don't really have energy. I feel quite uh, tired all the time because I've been taking medication for so many years. And maybe because of the medication, the Western medication I've been taking, maybe it suppresses my energy. When I went uh, to have the check out, the doctor told me that I had a list of uh, illness uh, related to my liver, stomach, heart, kidney. Uh, and so on. It seems that this person is not uh, is having so many problems and hard to say if this person can still continue to survive. Of course, living in this world with this flesh body, uh, it is unavoidable to have various kinds of issues. But uh, it really they don't have that much effort. I don't really have that kinds of energy to extend effort. The other day, I've, uh, I've said that I think it's really necessary to just limit the group of people who can come to long, uh, who can come to the shrine hall to listen to the classes. I think maybe this is better. I was, I've said a few days ago, uh, this is really necessary to limit it, to, to uh, constrain the size of uh, the Sangha member who can listen to the Dharma classes at the Shuang Hall. I've mentioned this quite a few times, but the management had encountered many issues and difficulties. This year, my goal is to finish at least the first half of the volume of uh, the Wish fulfilling treasury, and uh, maybe it's not possible for me to complete the Shrangama Sutra because there's still a lot that is left. So we will see how we can and how and when we can finish it. Um, also, in terms of time, it seems that we don't really have that much time to study either because after a short period of time of study, then we have some Dharma assemblies and then we have the summer holiday. Initially, I said that it's it's necessary to not have the summer holidays anymore this year because um, last few years we had long periods of uh, time that we are not engaging in study. But after having meetings, uh, all of them, especially the management from the Tibetan Lamas and Jomos, said that it's necessary to uh, enjoy the, the summer holiday, to have a period where they can relax. And so. On the 15th of uh, the Tibetan calendar, uh, the Lamas will begin to have their summer holidays. And it is only about 10, over 10 days. And then we will study for about 10 days of time. And then we will have about a week of time where we will have the Dharma assembly, the Garba uh, Dharma 
Dharma assembly. So, as you can see, we really don't have that many classes, that, min, that much time to uh, study. Well, on the other hand, we should be happy that we can study for even three classes every year. Sometimes, whenever I would go to different schools to give classes, um, I would go to a school to give only two or three classes and then fly to a different place to go to give three, two or three classes. From that perspective, then to have so many classes is already good. Initially, having Dharma teachings, giving Dharma teachings is something that everyone should be able to enjoy, but now it is uh, not possible to travel around to give Dharma teachings anymore. So, out of various reasons, it is uh, better for all of us not to crowd up in the shrine hall. It is temporarily going to be in that way. There is no way, um, there is no other method. I have to work with the situation skillfully. I'm trying to fulfill your wishes to give the Dharma teachings and so that you can receive the Dharma, but sometimes things just don't go the way that we wish for, though I have lots of um, aspiration, I don't have that much energy anymore. Some of the authorities came today and stated a few things that we need to pay attention, for example, no Dharma teaching that should be given online, for example, need to uh, pay attention to the safety of everyone's cabin. Then also the uh, COVID situation when it comes to the management of this institute. I think we need to be vigilant. Being here, I'm sure all of you have a good inspiration. However, if you were not to be vigilant, if you do not comply with the situation, then various kinds of results may occur. Especially, there are all kinds of different people here and different kinds of ideas. And if everyone just do whatever they wish, then what kinds of results that we will it is the annual award ceremony. In the past, it used to be at the end of the year, but nowadays they've changed this particular ceremony right after the Vajrasattva practice, Vajrasattva Dharma Assembly. I noticed there were lots of young people. They were quite excellent in their listening contemplation and uh, practice. On one hand, in the age of degeneration, to have such a sangha, to have a sangha that is truly engaged in study contemplation and practice, this is really rare. On the other, I think that it is all due to the effort and exertion of the kumpos and kumbos. They must have exerted lots of effort, otherwise it would be extremely difficult to have such kind of result. Of course, everything is impermanent. So we need to be, therefore we need to keep this in mind that we need to prepare ourselves that we are here to study and then later when we finish the study period we will go out to the world and start to propagate the Dharma. If you were to think that you will stay here forever, then at the time of parting from Larongar you would feel rather quite heartbroken. But if you already know that you will eventually leave here because you're here to study, then you would cherish the opportunity of staying here. This would be the best. Uh, this would be the best to make the aspiration to spread the Dharma to the people with auspicious connections. Now let's uh, let us begin our class on the Shrangama Sutra. Mm-hmm. <coughs> 
Jahur Tijishan, the Yelaman, Jimmy Pansoja, Soran, won't you top bump for a shinji low, won't you top bump for a shinji low, won't you top bump for a shinji low, which I have found in wonderful dharma is difficult to encounter in billions of aeons. I now see it here to receive and uphold it about to fathom the goddess true meaning to liberate all beings, let's generate the supreme Bodhicitta. Now we're currently studying the Shrangama Sutra. Previously, we've already covered the six entrances out of the uh, the six entrances. Now we're learning the twelve ayatanas. In the previous class, we've already covered the eyes with form and then the. <coughs> Then the ears with the sound, and then the nose and fragrance. So those six places were already covered from previous class. Now we will continue. Let us continue to talk about the tongue, that is the faculty, and then the taste. We know that for the twelve ayatanas, there are the six roots and six objects. Therefore, the twelve places, the twelve ayatanas. Now the Buddha told Ananda, twice every day you take up your bowl along with the rest of the every day you take up your bowl along with the rest of the assembly. The Buddha told Ananda, saying that in order to further investigate on the tongue and the taste, let me give you an example so that Ananda will be able to understand. Taking Ananda as an example, the Buddha said that you would take up your bowl along with the rest of the assembly twice a day, every day, and among what you receive and maybe things of supreme flavor such as curds and buttermilk and uh, clarified butter. So usually the monks, the monastics, would beg for alms, and the, in terms of the mealtime, they would have a morning uh, breakfast and then a lunch, and that's the only two meals they would take. Well, going out to beg for alms in the cities, sometimes you would receive things of supreme flavor, such as curds, buttermilk, and uh, clarified butter. In the Parinirvana Sutra, also, there is a similar example where it says that at the beginning, if you were to have a cow, and then uh, from the cow you will be able to get milk, which is which after churning you will be able to make curds. A type of cheese. And then after churning and you get the, the curds, there are two types of clarified uh, butter that would be left over. One is the raw um, clarified butter and the other one is the matured clarified butter or ghee. If you're familiar with the whole process of um, churning the milk and what kind of milk you would be able to get, usually the curds or the cheese is very similar to the Tibetan curds. In the breakfast, we would usually use those curds and mix it together with porridge in the morning. After churning the milk, what is left over is part curd and the other part is ghee. In Tibet, we would melt the ghee and then whatever is left is the curd. 
In Tibet, we would consider this porridge with ghee, mixed with ghee along with the silverweed roots, are the most delicious. Therefore, those kinds of food are usually offered to the monastics during the uh, offering time, and that is considered as the most supreme flavor. But that's just the tradition, and the young people nowadays, they're not very happy or they're not very satisfied with the silver wheat fruits, uh, the, the, the roots uh, cooked along with the ghee. They would rather prefer uh, some vegetables. They would be more interested in that. But for the older Tibetans, they indeed still keep the tradition of eating ghee along with silver uh, wheat root. Ghee is considered as something that is the uh, most supreme for the health of a human body. According to Parinirvana Sutra, it says that the ghee could cure lots of illness, including arthritis. But of course, you won't be able to eat too much. It is not recommended because it could also cause fatty liver. But in winter, I think some ghee with tamba would be very delicious and very healthy too. That being said, uh, nowadays I think ghee is getting uh, more and more expensive. Do you know how much it is per uh, half a kilo now? During the uh, Dharma assembly, it is uh, offered at a, a discount price of 28 RMB per half kilo. How many did you buy during that time? Four kilos. And you eat every day? How do you feel? It's okay. But you look rather quite skinny. I don't know if you actually eat sufficient amount. Do you also eat tamba? Tamba. The monk replies, I eat the Tibetan tea mixed with tamba and uh, ghee together for breakfast. And I would eat rice for lunch. So Tibetan breakfast, uh, a Han Chinese lunch, and no meal for the evening. Well, that's pretty good. Four kilos, that's quite a bit. How long usually does it take you to finish eating eight kilos? It would last all the way till the Kshitigarbha Dharma Assembly, and then you will purchase again during the Kshitigarbha Dharma Assembly during August or so, and then you can purchase again, which would last you till the uh, Sukhavati, the, the Amitavas um, uh, Dharma Assembly. Well, that's very smart of you. Anyhow, over here, since you said the ghee tastes really good, I'm going to ask you, does this supreme flavor of ghee uh, comes from the uh, tongue or from the food yeah, or from the space? Where does it come from? The Buddha over here asked Ananda, saying that, what do you think? Are these flavors produced from emptiness? Do they come forth from the tongue? Or are they produced from the food? Since you think it tastes really good, since you think that it has the supreme flavor, where does this supreme flavor come from? Where does this flavor come from? Does it come from your tongue faculty, or does it come from the food itself, or does it come from emptiness? Again, Ananda, suppose that the flavors came from your tongue. Now there is only one tongue in your mouth. When that tongue had already become the flavor of curd, then it would not change if it encountered some dark rock candy. The Buddha said that, well, without the tongue, you won't be able to taste it. So suppose the flavor came from your tongue. 
Now, on top of that, you have only one tongue, and that one tongue has already tasted the flavor of the ghee, this clarified butter's taste. After tasting it with your tongue, then the tongue has the characteristic of the taste of the ghee. At that time, if you were to taste some dark rock sugar, the, uh, according to the Tibetan translation, it is uh, the uh, rock sugar. The Buddha said that if you were to eat ghee first and then taste some rock sugar, your previous taste now has already transformed into the taste of sweetness. If it doesn't change, suppose it did not change, that would not be what is called knowing tastes. Because without change, then how would you be able to know the later taste of the sweetness from the rock candy? Suppose it did change. After tasting the ghee first and then the candy after, if the taste did change, since we know that the different tastes happens based on or with uh, reliant on our tongue faculty. The tongue is not many substances, and how could one tongue know so many tastes? Since we have only one tongue, then how could one tongue be able to know so many tastes? Since we have only one tongue, unlike how uh, in the, in the poetry, there is the particular description of calling the poisonous snake as a two-tongued, the two-tongued perverter. Usually it is used in such a way, but we have only one tongue. How would you be able to taste the two tastes? How would you be able to have the change of the taste from ghee to candy? This, uh, this follows the same logic from yesterday. Yesterday, we also listened to the sound. At the time of refuting the true uh, solid existence of sound, we need to understand that indeed there is a sound coming, let it be from drum or from the bell. The sound is there because it doesn't have any solid existence with a permanent nature. That is how a great number of uh, bhikshus and bhikshunis would be able to hear the sound along with Ananda and Kashyapa and Magdi Galayana. If the sound truly have a permanent nature and a characteristic that is unchanging, then the sound after entering into the ears of Ananda, then he won't be able to hear it even. Uh, the, none of the other people won't be able to hear it because as an entity, the sound has already entered the ear of Ananda. For the same reason, if this taste as an entity has a permanent nature, then that is to, uh, if, if your tongue has a permanent entity of a tasting ghee, then it is constant, it won't change anymore. If it changes, then you're saying that you have many tongues. So when we are studying the Shrangama Sutra, we need to understand that indeed the flavor doesn't have any true entity. It rather changes through the, cause, the different changes of causes and conditions. Such kind of phenomena is just like air and fog and the sun days. There is 
no no self character. There's no existing character to it. This is quite important. Because we can see all kinds of things. We can hear all kinds of things. We can see all kinds of colors, and we can smell fragrance and stench. Why does the Buddha? Why does the Buddha tell Ananda to say that if you were to refute one, then if you were to say that you have one, then you won't be able to have the other? Why does? Why is it? It is people after studying the the ornaments of Madhyamika will be able to understand. It is because. The sentient beings would hold on to something that is truly existent and that is uh, that has a self character and is an entity. That is how our grasping works. But if one were to say that the nature of all phenomena is not like that, then it is false. But to know that is false is completely different than our grasping. Yesterday during our after class presentation, I heard someone saying that why can't we hear many things? We would be able to hear many different sounds, isn't it? In fact, we've already covered that when we talked about the six places. We already covered that part. We know that the Buddha did not refute on the existence or the manifestation, rather, of the form. Sound, smell, taste, and touch. The Buddha did not refute on our function of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Since the Buddha did not refute any of those, what is the Buddha refuting? The Buddha simply refuted that there is one solid existent entity of any of those stated above. That is why during our empowerment, sometimes we are offered with something that tastes really good, sometimes rather not good. Whenever you look at those experiences, let it be a good flavor or a bad flavor, you need to make the observation where does that flavor comes from. Does it come from your tongue? Does it come from the ghee? Does it come from the uh, space in between? After such observation, then, uh, for you who ate that, who's going to eat that four kilos of ghee, you will be able to generate a different <laughs> level of uh, insights. Huh? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Previously, we've already refuted the flavor comes from the tongue. People probably won't think that the flavor comes from the tongue. But majority of people would think that the flavor comes from the food. But that is not reasonable either. How so? The Buddha continued to say that suppose it were produced from the food, the food does not have consciousness. How could it know tastes? Since the food doesn't have conscious, doesn't have it, the food is not sentient, then how could the food know its taste? If you were to say that the good flavor is produced from the food, then the food must be able to also know that it has a good flavor. But the food doesn't have consciousness. If ghee has consciousness, you would be committing killing while eating it. Otherwise, you would be eating ghee and then at the same time breaking the vow of killing. That's quite troublesome, isn't it? Moreover, if the food itself were recognized, 
were to recognize them, that would be the same as someone else eating. On top of that, if the food knows that it is delicious, then other people, it is just like someone else ate the ghee. What does it have to do with you? What connection would that have with what is called your recognition of taste? It is like you watching some other people eating the ghee. How would you be able to recognize what the other person tasted? If you were to say that the food has a flavor, then that is also unreasonable because it has nothing to do with you. The flavor has nothing, the good flavor has nothing to do with you. This part is observing uh, what produced the good flavor. In Vajrayana teaching, this is also a way of giving direct, in, uh, direct pointing out instruction. We we'll eat something good or we we'll eat something terrible. You should look at that flavor. Does it come from your tongue or does it come from the food or does it come from emptiness? And then you'll be able to come to the conclusion. In conventional truth, before we make any of those detailed observations, it is that with the cause and condition of the delicious ghee and uh, the cause and condition of the tongue and then with the consciousness uh, involved in between, at that time, there is the production of the feeling of good flavor. But that is not reliable because everything that is produced by cause and, con uh, cause and conditions are false. And they are not an entity that is solidly existent. According to the commentary of uh, Madhyamika composed by Mi Parambuche, he said that there is no Madhyamika practitioner that would refute the appearance, nor would they recognize anything that is truly existent. So that is a true Madhyamika practitioner. Now, suppose it were produced in emptiness, when you eat emptiness, what flavor does it have? If you think that the flavor comes from the uh, emptiness, then you can taste the uh, emptiness. What do you taste? Suppose that emptiness had the flavor of salt. Then, since your tongue was salty, your face would also be salty. And likewise, and likewise, everyone in the world would be like fish in the sea. Since you would be constantly influenced by salt, you would never know tastelessness. If you were to taste the emptiness, and suppose the taste of space is salty, and if such a saltiness it becomes part of um, your tongue, and such a saltiness influences your tongue to have this saltiness, and you're saying that saltiness comes from space, but your face can also touch space. Not only your face, your whole body, and everyone, in fact, all live in space, in, in, in this emptiness. In this way, you will be living in saltiness, the same as everyone else, just like fish living in ocean. So you would taste a salty flavor at all times, and you would never be able to have the tastelessness. That kind of neutral taste, or without taste. This is the logical 
inference that is used because sometimes people don't want to recognize that their understanding is false. Therefore, there need to be an inference for people to come to the understanding. So through this logical inference, the Buddha said that, well, if you were to say that if it's a tongue, if the flavor comes from the tongue or comes from the food or comes from emptiness, then uh, you would face such a kind of a faulty consequence or faulty uh, conclusion. If you were to say, since, since the Buddha has our, had already refuted uh, from the tongue and from the food, and now maybe the other person thinks that it comes from emptiness. The Buddha then gives that example, well, let's say if the emptiness tastes like salt, it could be sugar, it could be something else as well, but then if it, is ta if it tastes like salt, we are all immersed in emptiness. We're all immersed in this space. For that reason, the sentient beings, every sentient being would just be like the fish living in the ocean and would be infused in the salt, the salt flavor at all times. And we don't have to buy salt anymore. If you do not recognize the tastelessness, you would not be aware of the saltiness either. So the Buddha said that is since the saltiness and um, tastelessness is contrary to each other, also reliant, exist, uh, exist while reliant on each other. If one exists, the other exists. So if you were to say that there is no tastelessness, and there is then naturally without any any salt flavor either. Previously, Ananda maybe felt quite happy about eating ghee, but at the end, you will recognize that there is really nothing that is existent. The flavor of the four kilos of ghee probably doesn't have any, doesn't have any flavor. That is quite sad, isn't it? You probably would throw away all of your ghee. Therefore, you should know that neither flavors nor tongues tasting has a location. The taste, the tongue, and the tasting, the method of receiving the flavor, in fact, the three of them have no place. Since the tongue and the flavor doesn't have any place, doesn't have any location, and so the two places of tasting and flavor are empty and false. If you cannot obtain the object of I, then there is no seeing. If you cannot obtain the true entity of the object of sound, then there is no hearing. If you can't obtain a truly existent object of the fragrance, then there is no sniffing or smelling. For the same reason, if you cannot obtain any truly existent flavor, then how could there be tasting? How could there be the, the tongue faculty? There, therefore, the Buddha said their origin is not in cause and conditions, nor do their natures arise spontaneously. Ananda, they are simply part of the wondrous manifestation out of the Buddha nature. This wondrous function, after studying the entering the way of great vehicle, you would probably gain a better understanding. All the sentient beings between the hell realm being all the way to attaining full enlightenment, 
There is the manifested subject, and then at the time of a clear, at the time of completely being purified, then that becomes the pure wisdom. Before it is purified, then the feelings, the sensations of the six realm beings are different. Uh, that is that has been explained quite uh, quite in detail in the entering the way of the great vehicle. Now let's look at the next one. Ananda, early every morning you rub your head with your hand. Now the Buddha started to uh, expound on the touch and the root of body. Ananda at this point stops saying anything, doesn't respond anymore. Initially, after the Buddha finished giving the teachings on the six entrances, he should have said something, or after finished giving the teaching on the twelve ayatanas, he should have some he should have said something, but he didn't. Anyhow, the Buddha kept on giving the teaching. The Buddha said that in the morning, when you touch your head with your hand, it is a tradition for the monastics to touch their hand uh, touch their head with their hands uh, in the Milan tradition for example master Bai Zhang in some of the precepts he said that as monastic one should touch the head three times especially in the morning one should touch the head for three rounds why is that it is because one need to remember that one has already shaved the head to become the disciple of the Buddha, so one should revere the precepts as the teacher and practice with the four mindfulness. In Master Han Shan's uh, recollection of a dream, he also said that the monastics should constantly touch the head. It is a practice to maintain right mindfulness. So it is really a practice for the monastics to remember that, oh, I have no hair anymore and I am different than the, uh, than the worldly beings because the worldly beings still have hair and I myself shaved off my hair voluntarily, unlike people who are forced to shave off their hair, for example, the inmates, or shave off their hair by uh, the barber. It is not like that at all. It is uh, to give up the eight worldly dharma. It is a sign of that. If one, if a monastic have already shaven the hair and do not want to give up all the eight worldly dharma, that would be quite a shame. That would be quite embarrassing. So why don't we all touch our, hair, our head right now? Maybe some of you still have hair and maybe some of you uh, don't. Now, there is a sensation of touch. The sensation of touch. What do you think, Ananda? The Buddha asked. When there is a sensation of the rubbing, where does the ability to make contact lie? At the time of rubbing your head, of touching your uh, scalp, your uh, scalp, is it smooth or is it rough? Because you're touching stub, uh, stubby hair, or um, if it's really smooth. So where is that sensation of rubbing? Is the ability in the hands or is it in the head? Where is that sensation? Again, this is another direct pointing out instruction. At the time of touching your, uh, your head, while the hand touches your head, there is a sensation. Now, where is that sensation? On your head or on your hand? Uh, 
在哪 ？Where is it？ 啊，都有是吧 ？Both？ 你觉得呢 ？What do you think？ 摸了没有 ？Have you touched your your head？ Where is it then？ 啊？肯定是透过手的接触，但是接触感觉透过手。Through the sensation of the touch, through the contact of the hand. 这是自己的感觉。Just a sensation, she said. She doesn't even want to. Expe- she doesn't even、uh, want to share that. Where is it? Where is the sensation on your head or on your hand? And she answered, "They're all illusory. They're all false." You're quite smart because later I will start to refute her. Okay, all false, right? Okay. If it is, if it、uh, were in the hands, then the hand would have no knowledge of it. Your your head would have no knowledge. If it were in the hands, then the head would have no knowledge of it. Then the head would have no knowledge of it. Then the head would have no knowledge of it. If it were in the head, if it were in the head, then the hands would be useless. 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 Then the hands would be Two dualistic thoughts at the same time. The non-dual information can be experienced at,、um, at one time. For example, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body can receive those information at one time without dualism. But once there is a dualistic thoughts, one one mind stream cannot produce two dualistic thoughts at one time, because if that were to happen, that would be two mind streams. If there were only one touch in the head and the hand, then the hand and the head would be of one substance. If you were to say that there is one sensation, there is this one touch, then hand and head would become of one entity, be, become one thing. If these two are not together, not one thing, how could it have one one touch, one sensation of touch? If they were one substance, if you were to say that a hand and head are one thing, then no touch would be possible. They are. If you were to say that they are the same thing, then there is no touch because you need two things to have the touch. The motion of touch, isn't it? The hand is one thing, and then the head is another thing. Only when you rub them, that is the sensation of touch. But if you were to say that、um, they are of the same thing, it is to say that how could your one Nail touch the same nail because they are the same thing. It, it can have the, the touch, the motion of it. If there were two substances, to which would be the touch belong? 
the one which was capable of touch would not be the one that had that was touched. The one that was touched would not be the one that was capable of touch. Nor should it be that of the touch came into being between you and emptiness. If the hand that can touch and the head that can be touched, then the sensation, then when we talk about the sensation, if the sensation were to be located on the hand that can touch, it has nothing to do with what can be touched, which is the head. In this way, the one which was capable of touch would not be the one that was touched. Before making observation, you feel that touching your head has this sense of touch, has this sensation. But when you look at it through the theory with observation, in fact, the sensation indeed is illusory. You cannot obtain it. Similarly, there is no uh, the, the one which was capable of touch would not be the one that was touched. The one that was touched would not be the one that was capable of touch. Nor should it be that the touch came into being between you and emptiness. You can't say that the space has the sensation of touch. That is not possible. Therefore, you should know that neither the sensation of touch nor the body has a location. And so the two places of the body and the touch are empty and false. By now you should know that the touch, which is the, the uh, object of the uh, dust of the object and uh, the body, which is the dust of the faculty of the body, as well as the sensation, this three doesn't have any location. The body and touch, I think when we talk about the sound, the, the form and taste and fragrance, those are easy to understand. But when it comes to touch, let it be animate or inanimate. That sensation of being in contact is called touch. But I think this explanation is very clear. At the beginning of studying Abhidharma and uh, Gateway to Knowledge, I thought touch is very difficult to understand. The other four, the form, sound, fragrance, and uh, taste, is rather diff uh, easier to understand because they are rather quite uh, consistent in logic. But when it comes to touch, it is a bit difficult to understand because touch and the sensation, it has, it is a little bit more complex to understand. And so the two places of body and touch are empty and false. So the body and the touch, it's simply false. It is uh, the origin is not in cause and condition, nor do their natures arise spontaneously. They're just miraculous and uh, a wondrous manifestation of Buddha nature. There is no true existence or entity. So today, let's stop here.